All right, as we're uh, starting the uh, webinar and everybody is uh, starting to come in the room and join, we'd just like to thank everybody for joining us today for this uh, vet chat here uh, about uh, sudden death, cardiac death in horses. Uh, this is a project that Grayson funded uh, this past year in 2021 uh, through the University of Minnesota with uh, Drs. Molly McHugh and C.N. Derwood Akehurst. I hope I pronounced that. Didn't butcher it too much. Uh, as you'll see, there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, <clears throat> bottom of your program on Zoom. If you just use that to ask questions, we'll come back on at the end of the program uh, and answer any of those questions in a, in a certain order or no order uh, what they come in, but as probably a relevance comes in. So without any further ado, I'd like to thank you ladies, both uh, doctors for coming on and doing this today. It's a, it's a, uh, great honor and pleasure to not only fund your research, but have you come out here and tell everybody about it. And thank you so much again. Of course, you're welcome. Thanks so much for having us here. Um, we're really excited to talk about uh, the project that we're working on. And I'll just a way of uh, brief introduction. Um, I'm Molly McHugh. Um, I've been at the University of Minnesota for my entire faculty career. Um, I'm a large animal equine internist by training, and then uh, my research focuses in genetics. And um, one of the really great things about being a researcher, and actually my favorite part, is um, training people and watching them go on to do great things. And so um, Sean is a brand new faculty member, um, just about eight months into being a grown up, as she says, uh, at the University of Minnesota. I was very blessed that uh, she's also an equine internist. She trained with us. I was her uh, residency advisor, and then she came to do a PhD with me and, and stayed after a PhD actually to do a postdoc. And we have a lot going on in cardiac arrhythmias in this work, and it's really Sean's baby. And she now is a, is a grown up is leading the project. So you're going to hear mostly from her, um, but it's fun to be here and uh, watch her talk about it because um, I've known Sean for a long time now. So the best part of research is the people you get to train. But just by a couple ways of introduction, Sean's gonna talk about her whole project, which has quite a lot of breadth and depth, um, all of which is relevant uh, to racehorses, um, including parts of the project, sort of the bigger picture project. Um, obviously Grayson has given us a lot of support and there are very clear objectives on that project, but we thought it would be important to talk about what we're doing in this area as a whole, because all the pieces um, fit together to hopefully come out with solutions um, for the horse. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sean and just smile and nod and be the, the proud academic mother while she talks about her work, because this is really her brainchild. Thank you very much, Molly, and um, thank you as well to obviously the Grayson Jockey Club for funding us um, and for inviting us to talk with you today. Um, I will um, get started. Um, so as Molly said, we're talking about the whole project and really our big goal is to identify horses that are at high risk of arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death with the goal of um, identifying the ones that are important so we can monitor them more thoroughly and try and reduce the um, rate of sudden cardiac death. So today I'm going to give a little bit of a review of the equine heart um, and probably part of the reason why we see um, quite as many arrhythmias as, as we do. Um, and then we'll talk about breaking into the next two sections of what we know about arrhythmias um, and then what we're doing to try and um, answer some key questions that I will pose. Um, and then similarly with sudden cardiac death, what we know about sudden cardiac death um, and how we're planning on answering some key questions um, that will hopefully enable us to reduce the rate of sudden cardiac death. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I'll start with a review of the equine heart. Um, and so we all know um, that horses are absolutely tremendous athletes. Um, but what is really amazing is that even the average thoroughbred horse racehorse really their cardiac potential dwarfs the ability of the very best human sprinters in the world um, and this is not what's interesting is the heart rate is actually relatively similar but the cardiac output can be five times as much as that um, of humans and their aerobic capacity is really um, really quite impressive um, however when I was looking this up and and looking to see whether the horse was the most um, efficient um, 
uh, animal that we could find, um, I discovered this. Um, this is an Etruscan shrew, um, and their aerobic capacity is 400 mils per kilo per minute. So the horse isn't at the top, but we know that they're really quite spectacular. Um, and one of the big hypotheses has always been that the bigger the horse's heart, the faster they run. And there's some pretty nice examples um, of that um, on this slide, on this side, slide here. Um, there is a there is a correlation we have here in the black dots, um, just some regular or average racehorses in 1987 um, and their cardiac output on the y axis versus their heart size in kilos. Um, and then at the top here, we have known heart sizes and cardiac outputs. Um, of some of the elite racehorses um, and sadly Secretariat's heart was never actually um, weighed but there's a pre prediction of what the heart um, says uh, the heart size was and so um, you know it would be lovely we you can look at this a little bit further and hmm, this slide there we go my slides are fancy now um, and there are there's additional evidence to support that there is a correlation between the size of the heart and um, the horse's um, VO2 max. So in the black dots here, we have national hunt horses. Um, this is a study from the UK. The white um, dots are flat horses. Um, and then the triangles are just horses that are that were owned by the previous Animal Health Trust. Um, and in the national hunt horses, there was a correlation between heart size um, and VO2 max, and so you would assume performance as well. Um, but we all know that heart size is not alone, is not sufficient to predict whether a horse is gonna go on to win the triple crown. And really it's much more complicated than just that. So over the over the years, we've selectively bred these horses to have incredible athletic potential and probably increase their heart size as well. Um, and this is one of the major advantages of selectively breeding animals for athletic potential is there are a lot less um, damaging structural diseases that we see. So it's really very rare in the horse for us to see dilated cardiomyopathy or hypertrophic cardi cardiomyopathy, or even some of the localized um, cardiomyopathies that we see in um, humans and other um, animal species. Um, VSDs do occur, and but they're, they're definitely not common. Um, and although we do see aortic valvular regurgitation in a lot of adult horses sort of later in life, it's quite unusual for that to be sort of a developmental disease or a disease that we see in very early life. And the horses that do develop um, significant um, aortic or other valvular regurgitation at, at a young age, typically have a poor performance or are less, are less able to perform than um, horses that do not. But with selective um, breeding, we reduce the genetic diversity and we do um, increase the risk of having some problems. We know that there's um, a pretty high prevalence of exercise induced pulmonary hemorrhage, um, which is massively underestimated just by the clinical signs of having a horse bleeding out through its nose. Um, we know that a lot of horses have um, valvular, um, valvular incompetence, so at least 20% of healthy thoroughbreds have some degree of valvular re regurgitation when you examine them. And we don't know the clinical significance. We, we assume in a lot of horses that it's insignificant, um, but the f we could follow up on this more. Um, and then we see an increased risk of developing arrhythmias. So this is, um, is a human ECG of someone in normal sinus rhythm going into ventricular fibrillation, which is typically fatal unless you can intervene um, early on. So with that, we'll talk a little bit about arrhythmias um, and what, what we know so far. So um, just a brief review, um, we typically can recognize arrhythmia sometimes when we're doing cardiac auscultation and the heart doesn't sound nice and regu regular. Um, and then ideally we would do an ECG to determine what sort of arrhythmia we're evaluating because um, apart with the exception of sort of second degree atrioventricular block, there are very few arrhythmias that you can definitively diagnose just on um, auscultation alone. Um, so when we look at an ECG, um, we look at the RR interval, which is this is the depolarization of the um, ventricles, um, and we can see that it's nice and regular here. But we're also looking for multiple different waveforms, which I'm not going to talk about, but um, we'll talk a little bit about the P wave, um, which is important because we get a P and then we get this QRS complex, and this is a nice normal sinus rhythm.
However, when you take the horse at the bottom here, you can see that although we do have QRST, QRST, we have this sort of undulating um, baseline um, and the QRS complexes are not evenly spaced. So there's a couple here, then there's a bit of a gap, another couple, a bit of a gap. And this is what we would call an irregularly ir irregular rhythm. Um, and this is an example of atrial fibrillation, uh, which I will talk about um, in the next, in the couple of slides. So it, um, it's arrhythmias are really surprisingly have a surprisingly high prevalence in um, racehorses, with almost half of them having some kind of arrhythmia at exercise. Um, so when we when we look at the arrhythmias, we're looking at supraventricular, which are, originate above the atrioventricular node here, so they're pert mainly pertaining to the um, atria or ventricular which in involves the rest of the um, depolarization cycle and the um, ventricles themselves um, and you can see that almost half of standard breads have some kind of supraventricular arrhythmia and about 30 percent of thoroughbreds have some kind of ventricular arrhythmia at exercise or in the immediate, immediately post-exercise recovery period and what's even more remarkable um, is that 16% of apparently healthy racehorses develop complex arrhythmias. Now, these are arrhythmias that if you were a human, you would typically experience um, and you experience them under medical care. You may even re require defibrillation um, to correct them. But a lot of these horses seem to be able to go spontaneously go back to a normal sinus rhythm um, without intervention, um, which is really quite remarkable. So the problem is we don't really know what the relevance of these arrhythmias are. Given how prevalent they are, a lot of them may well not be having an effect on performance. Um, but we know that some, in particular atrial fibrillation, leads to poor performance. Um, and then there's pretty strong evidence that some of these um, lead to sudden cardiac death as well. But we, what we don't know is of the almost 50% of horses that have arrhythmias, how many of them will go on to have um, significant effects such as sudden cardiac death. <clears throat> and I don't have time to talk about the numerous causes of cardiac arrhythmias in racehorses. Um, the ones that we're most interested in are lone arrhythmias where <clears throat> they're, they're not caused by underlying metabolic disease or drugs. There's no, the horse is fit and healthy. Um, their heart, hearts are structurally normal and for whatever reason they go into an arrhythmia, maybe come back out of an arrhythmia or they go on to collapse um, and die or have problems. And so I mentioned um, earlier on the atrial fibrillation is, um, is a cause of poor performance um, and it's the most common pathologic arrhythmia in horses. Um, and I showed you the ECG before, so we have a normal horse at the top and then we have this irregularly irregular um, rhythm at the bottom. And we know that um, horses with poor performance actually have a slightly higher prevalence of um, atrial fibrillation than horses than regular horses. So the prevalence of regular horses is about 0.11%. But when you look at just horses um, with poor performance, their prevalence is somewhere between 1% and 2%. Um, so we know that atrial fibrillation is having an impact. Um, and we know that horses that are, are required to maximally exert themselves, so thoroughbred racehorses, standard red racehorses, horses that do, are doing three-day eventing are likely to have poor performance um, with this arrhythmia. What's tremendously difficult is to know when horses are in that ry ry rhythm or not. So many horses spontaneously convert, so over 95% of um, thoroughbred racehorses will go back into a normal sinus rhythm within 24 hours of um, them having the poor performance episode. Um, but it's very difficult to know whether those horses will go on to have another episode of arrhythmia or whether they, they will just carry on. Um, and that's certainly one of the biggest questions I get asked at the racetrack is, OK, this horse has um, atrial fibrillation. They treat it however they um, want to. What's going to happen? Is this horse going to have it again? Should they sell it or should they keep running with it and try to um, or is there anything they can do to try and prevent it happening because obviously they don't want the horse to not run well or to have more devastating effects such as, such as sudden sudden death um so we really we have these key questions so two the they're, they're, they're kind of twofold 
which horses will develop an arrhythmia um, and then which arrhythmias are important. And so um, what I'm going to talk about is, is how we use ECG predictions and genetics um, to go on um, figure out which horses will develop an arrhythmia. Um, and then in the long run, this is going to help us to determine which arrhythmias are um, important, whether some of the other more common arrhythmias are contributing to poor performance, um, whether they're having any um, clinical disease, and whether or not they're leading to sudden cardiac death, um, which is a prospective sort of long term study that we will um, participate in. Um, so we've already done some research looking at possible ideas for monitoring um, resources on the track. Um, this little device um, that you can see us holding here is called um, an Alive Core ECG. Um, and they are very, very easy to use. Um, we didn't clip the horses, um, and these were teaching horses that we used that were somewhat hairy, not excessively hairy. Um, and, when we were, and we were able to compare it to sort of the gold standard, which is the Televet, um, and show that they were usable to identify horses, at least in um, healthy horses, horses that had sort of normal, normal arrhythmias, the second degree AV block, and those that didn't. And they were pretty equivalent to the Televet for the basic measurements. Um, they're very affordable and so could be used by track vets for horses that need increased monitoring, um, but they can only be used at rest. They can't be used um, at exercise um, because they need to be held in place. Um, so the Televet is the goal is pretty much the gold standard. Um, it's relatively easy to use. Um, it's not inexpensive, but it's um, you can use it multiple times. It's not a single use device. Um, and we can use this before exercise, um, during exercise, and then in the immediate um, post-exercise recovery period. Um, and typically we see the arrhythmias either at exercise or in the re post-exercise um, recovery period. Certainly if we saw some of the um, supraventricular and ventricular arrhythmias in the resting horses, then we would let the trainers know um, and they might not want to train their horses that day. Um, but the challenge with exercising ECGs is they're time consuming. You can only really do them on the days where the horses are being trained hard um, for what we're trying well, for what we're looking for. They um, require both trainer and jockey cooperation. Um, and there's also pretty significant movement artifacts. Um, the, the electrodes go on underneath the surcingle and then in standardbreds they go under the harness and in thoroughbreds they go underneath the saddle. But we still have problems with leads popping off sometimes um, and certainly with the horses galloping, there's some movement artifact as well. Sorry, there we go. Um, so um, the next, thing to do, um, I mentioned we, we're sort of interested in predominantly low arrhythmias um, is ruling out primary structural heart disease um, using an echocardiogram. Um, and structural changes would be relatively easy to monitor. Um, it would just require fairly regular echoes, but most of the horses with arrhythmias have structurally normal hearts. Um, and so it's something that it, which makes it even more difficult to predict which horses will go on to vet to develop an arrhythmia because when they're standing in the stall their ha hearts look normal they sound normal their ecgs are normal how do you know which horse is going to go on and develop um an arrhythmia um and i'm both, both molly and i are trained um geneticists um and that's one of the things this is actually one of the studies that first um highlighted the possibilities of looking at um the genetics of um arrhythmias in racehorses. So the atrial fibrillation, which as I mentioned is the most common pathologic arrhythmia, is about 30% heritable in horses and humans, which is what we would consider a moderately heritable trait. Um, and what this means is that genetics, the horse's genetics contribute about 30% of the risk of an individual going on to develop atrial fibrillation. Um, but the environment um, is pretty is pretty important and the environment also plays a role in, as to whether or not the horse is even identified as having atrial fibrillation. We can see some horses that are relatively low level um, and don't get worked hard where atrial fibrillation is just picked up um, at, at the yearly vaccinations and you have no idea how long that horse has been in atrial fibrillation because it hasn't been having poor performance. Whereas if you're a racehorse um, and you, your atria aren't functioning properly, you're gonna be identified much quicker. Um, but what really excited me was that several of the exercises 
associated arrhythmias um, and familial atrial fibrillation are highly heritable in humans. And what that means is that genetics play a really big role. So over sort of 60 to 70 percent um, of the um, risk of um, these arrhythmias comes from genetics. And that's that's sort of where what where we started and where we started reading a bit more about um, this this study. So um, as I as I mentioned, these are our key questions, and now I'll go on to how our study is going to help address um, and answer some of these questions for us. So um, we um, we have funding through several agencies, including the Race and Jockey Club, um, to perform phenotyping on um, a thousand racehorses, um, including auscultation, ECG echocardiography um, and then we're also collecting an additional 100 horses with atrial fibrillation through our collaborators um, but all of these horses will have um, an exercising ECG performed um, and first of all I'm going to talk about the genetics um, so having built off the reading that some of the um, familial forms of atrial fibrillation were highly heritable. Um, Molly had already collected um, some atrial fibrillation cases. And so um, during my PhD, we performed whole genome sequencing of these horses to look at all of the DNA base pairs across the across the genome. Um, and then to prioritize them, we we've initially started just at looking in human um, biologic candidate genes um, and specifically ion channel channelopathy genes. So these are genes that are, are involved in depolarization and repolarization of, of the horse's heart. Um, and then we looked at um, the variants that were present at a in the general horse population, which is whole genome sequence of 534 horses at an allele frequency of less than 5%. Um, and the reason we did this is because most of the highly heritable disease causing variants are not common in, a, in, a, in the general population. Um, and this is data from humans. Um, and certainly it's one of the things that we're also looking at what the appropriate cutoff is in horses. Um, but for right now, this is where, where we're at because we're trying to find the, the most highly heritable ones because the, that's, that's a great place for us to start. Um, and then we can build on them as we learn more about what the variants are doing. So we also looked at variants that were um, at the same site as known arrhythmia causing variants in humans. And we have about 111 of those. And then we have 314 that are within these genes, but um, not at a known human site. So that gives us 425 variants for follow up and that will they will be genotyped in all 1100 horses um, of the study population that we have. Um, and so what are we hoping hoping to find so um if we assume that this this sequence here is the reference um and the the reference which horses which is actually a thoroughbred is a, a g at this position here but we have a c to g um base pair change in one of the important iron channel genes and when we look at the normal horses they all have two copies of the reference um g allele but when we look at the horses that have atrial fibrillation or one of the other arrhythmias, almost all of them are homozygous. So they have two copies for this mutation. Um, and that seem, that would suggest that this variant segregates with the phenotype um, of atrial fibrillation. So we would need to look um, more thoroughly at this, but this would, this would give us pretty strong um, evidence to support this variant potentially contributing to the um, arrhythmia. But um, as ever, ever, nothing is ever simple. Um, and so there's some horses, this one and this one, that are actually heterozygous for the mutation, which would suggest that if this was a recessive trait um, where you need two copies of the mutation to cause the disease, that these two horses should be over here. Um, what's likely happening is these horses have an additional risk um, risk mutation that's contributing to them having atrial fibrillation um, and that's why um, we can answer a lot of questions early on but this is going to be a need to be an ongoing study until we can get all of the genetic contribution to the disease so um why why are we looking for um 
the sort of the genetic variants. So genetic testing um, is incredibly useful for identifying horses that are at risk of developing a particular phenotype. And in this case, we're interested in horses that will go on to collect, um, to, to develop an arrhythmia. So if we take a foal here and we collect blood to isolate DNA, we can look at the base pairs that we're, we're interested in that um, cause cause the disease. So let's just say it's this C, C to G here, which this horse is um, hetero, this foal would be heterozygous for, but um, if we if it was homozygous, then we would know that it's at a higher risk of having um, an arrhythmia. Whereas if it was lower risk, we wouldn't necessarily need to monitor it more closely. But if it's a high risk one, we would want to do increased screening. So more regular, um, more regular ECGs, potentially even ECGs the day before the day of racing to make sure that the horse is in a nice, normal sinus rhythm. Um, and I'll talk about some of the additional ECG monitoring tools that we'll have um, in the next few slides. Um, and then this will also help us to make educated breeding decisions. We're not going to be in the sort of position to be able to say, OK, this horse has this um, variant. We should never breed this horse again, because by doing that, we're potentially li limiting um, the genetic diversity of the of the population even further. And thoroughbreds in particular, are incredibly hybrid, highly inbred. And we don't want to reduce the breeding pool any further. But we could say that that horse with a mutation doesn't is not allowed to breed with a horse, another horse that has the mutation because you massively increase your risk of having offspring that have that mutation. Whereas if you breed it to one that doesn't have um, the mutation, you can decrease your genetic risk while maintaining the av available genetic variation as well. Um, and so then moving on to EC, ECG predictions, um, and this is some really exciting work that um, we, oh gosh, there we go, my size, not advancing, that we um, started collaborating with um, the University of Surrey and Rossdale's on. Um, so all credit um, here has to go to Dr. Jeevaratnam and um, Dr. Celia Ma. Um, and they've developed a technique um, that takes resting ECGs. Um, and then uses a computational algorithm which converts the ECG, so each P wave, each, each QRS complex and each T wave um, into a binary code, which the computer then uses. Um, and they've shown very nicely that they can use this um, to predict horses that have previously had atrial fibrillation. Um, so this here um, is some complexity analysis <clears throat> on the Y axis and the numbers aren't particularly important um, other than to know <clears throat> they're sort of decreasing from 0 0.03 down to minus 0 0.03 and in blue here we have control horses um, and in red we have horses that have previously had atrial fibrillation but have either been treated and gone back into um, sinus rhythm or have spontaneously converted back into sinus rhythm and you can see here that there's reduced complexity in these horses um, and what's really interesting is this is actually similar to um, to some work that they've shown in humans that um, human individuals that have previously had um, an arrhythmia have um, abnorm abnormalities that can be detected at rest. Um, and we're, we're going to extend this, um, and this is um, the, the proposal that we was recently funded through the Grace and Chalky <coughs> Club Foundation, excuse me, <coughs> to um, look at other arrhythmias as well. So when they use the feature detection in the computer, it actually doesn't involve any measure of the atrial um, depol depolarization or repolarization. It's purely based on ventricular um, the ventricular complexes. Um, and so we think that we'll be able to use this um, to identify other, other um, type horses that have other types of arrhythmia at exercise. And what is incredibly helpful by this is that it requires resting ECGs. So obviously for our analysis, we need to do both resting and exercising ECGs. Um, but in the long term, this would mean that we could just do a, at, rest tra at, re at rest trace of an ECG and then use the computational um, tools to de determine whether or not they're going to be at higher risk of developing an arrhythmia or not. So this is a really viable option for monitoring horses um, in the future to see which ones are at higher risk. And what we'll do is determine sort of in the um, 
like over the racing over the racing periods are there times where we can use this to say well you're even at even a higher risk of developing an arrhythmia or poor performance and should therefore be rested um or evaluated by a veterinarian um and so sort of the ecgs and complete workups on the 1100 um, racehorses are going to be able to help us to identify which horses develop arrhythmias and be able to predict this using a combination of their genetics and resting ECGs. Um, and then it's also going to allow us to prospectively follow up high risk horses um, and use their performance data to determine which arrhythmias are important for poor performance, clinical disease and sudden cardiac death. And at the moment, it's really difficult to be able to to decide which horses that need monitoring more closely to answer these questions. Um, so our research is going to give us the tools to be able to monitor horses more closely and to figure out what is contributing to their risk of sudden cardiac death. So with that in mind, we're now going to, I'm now going to move on to um, what we know about sudden cardiac death um, and how our research is going to impact that as well. So um, fortunately, sudden cardiac death isn't common, um, but as we all know, it's absolutely devastating when it occurs. Um, and it's somewhere between 1.1 to 1.5 or so, depending on the year, per 1,000 race starts in thoroughbreds. Um, what that doesn't account for is horses that die on the track in between um, in between racing starts. This is, these are only horses that are um, actually training or racing um, that are included and so that we're probably underestimating to some extent this um, the number of sudden deaths that happen each year um, and in race in thoroughbred races racehorses um, about 19 percent of these are classed as sudden death um, and what that means is that they they die, die for some reason that's not immediately clear um, and they're certainly not related to fractures uh, catastrophic fractures or catastrophic injuries so when we look at those, about 19% of the sudden death cases are caused by um, cardiac abnormalities that are identified at post-mortem. Um, but 47% of them, so almost half of them, have no diagnosis and necropsy. Um, and we just don't know how many of those are caused by arrhythmias. Um, and in humans, the, the percentages are actually relatively similar. Um, and a large number of the ones that are that have no diagnosis of necropsy or termed autopsy negative go on to have <clears throat> some form of genome sequencing, whether it's just candidate gene sequencing or um, sequencing the whole genome. Um, and about a third of those get an, uh, get a diagnosis um, at that level. And this adds extra weight to the fact that it's, pos it's quite probable that um, genetics are contributing to the risk of arrhythmias in horses as well. Um, so as I've mentioned, arrhythmias are usually undetectable at necropsy. Um, usually by the time the horse is evaluated, if it's not quite dead on the, on the track, um, the arrhythmia is already in a, a terminal Termin terminal arrhythmia, sorry. Um, and so it's not particularly helpful to know what type of arrhythmia is going on. Um, so it's it's a really big issue of determining how many um, arrhythmias and which arrhythmias do lead to sudden cardiac death. And so we, like similar to the key questions about the arrhythmias, we also have key questions about sudden cardiac death. So how often do arrhythmias lead to um, sudden ca cardiac death and why do certain horses with arrhythmias um, collapse and die? And then in the, as we move forward, what can we do to stop these arrhythmias of either developing or prevent them developing from an arrhythmia into sudden cardiac death? So our original study population um, are focused predominantly on um, the arrhythmia section, but we're also in the process of adding 100 horses with sudden cardiac death um, <clears throat> collected at um, collected across the US um, from various different racetracks. Um, and our research is going to lead to answering these questions through improved identification of horses at risk of arrhythmias, which will mean that we can monitor them, those ones more closely to determine when and if they go on um, to develop sudden cardiac death. Um, we'll be able to monitor them um, more closely through the combination of using um, the ECG algorithm um, and also through um, 
in sort of encouraging and highlighting the importance of cardiac monitoring in um, these high risk horses. Um, and then, as I've mentioned before, we'll be able to prospectively look at look at identifying risk factors for sudden cardiac death. <clears throat> so we can if we can monitor these horses that are at increased genetic risk or have um, signs on their ECGs that suggest that they should be monitored more more closely. Um, then we can over time de determine what is going on in these horses and why do some of them collapse and die. Um, and then. This is a huge, um, it's a huge project, and we're incredibly um, grateful for everybody that's involved and all the funding that supported us. Our big goal is to reduce the rate of sudden cardiac death, um, and so we're studying the basic ECGs and genetics um, on a, on the a thousand racehorses um, plus the additional hundred um, standard red racehorses with um, atrial fibrillation. Um, and then in this collaboration with um, Celia and Camelan, we're um, looking at advanced ECG analysis um, to determine if we can predict using resting ECGs, which horses will go on to develop um, arrhythmias at exercise. Um, and then we're also um, planning on echo echoing all of these horses to look at what structural um, abnormalities are there. How many of these horses have regurgitation? Um, if they have any um, flow irregularities or um, uh, contraction abnormalities, um, and then we'll we'll look at their performance overall and see whether we can find any correlations or associations there. Um, and overall, this will help us answer our questions and then contribute to this this goal of reducing sudden cardiac death. Um, and so I, before I pass over to um, Molly, I just want to thank everyone that's involved in this project. Um, it's been from six um, standard red racehorses with whole genome sequence. It's, it's developed quite um, spectacularly and we're very incredibly grateful um, for the funding that we have and our collaborators um, and co-investigators. Um, and just to highlight um, just a few, um, over the, Last summer, Dr. Gold, um, M, Adam, and Kendall all helped me um, collect samples um, at the tracks, um, and then also the Stronach Group and um, Dr. Lynn Hovda at the Minnesota Racing Commission, um, who have been instrumental in helping us get access to these horses um, and encouraging the trainers to work with us, um, and obviously the trainers, owners, and racehorses themselves, um, who we couldn't do this work without. Um, and with that. I can pass over to Molly. Yeah, and I think you'll have to hit refresh on your Google slides because it didn't put the last slide in, but um, thanks, Sean, for, for um, that. And I just wanted to come back in the end. Obviously, this is Sean's baby, and um, she's done a lot of work on this, but really to just reiterate um, how grateful we are for the funding and then to talk about um, which Sean has already sort of uh, reviewed. And unfortunately, the picture I made for you is technology is uh, uh, limiting that. But just to reiterate, like our overall goals here, you know, when we're done with this project in the end, what we would like to see is that there's a genetic test that allows us before horses ever go into training um, or racing to identify horses that may be at higher risk for what could be uh, fatal cardiac uh, arrhythmias. Um, and then be able to use that information to identify horses that racetrack veterinarians should be looking at more frequently. Um, we know that the best way to do that is with ECGs at exercise, but of course, as Sean pointed out, that's not easy to do, which is why the tools that are funded by Grayson are so important. We would like to be able to put in the hands of racetrack veterinarians something like the iPhone-based ECG that Sean talked about where then they could essentially have an app that would take what looks like a normal resting ECG um, that actually, when we look at it computationally, predicts those horses that may have trouble. And knowing a horse may have trouble on a particular day would allow then that veterinarian to decide whether or not the horse should be um, exercised or you know, at fast exercise or whether the horse should um, be rested or exercised um, less intensively and, and certainly whether or not the horse should race. In the ideal world, um, this work, none of it will make a horse not potentially be an athlete, but it will allow us to look at them and really monitor them on the day of racing or exercise. And then also over time, as we start to follow these horses forward, 
one of the things that we're looking for, will there be key things that tell us maybe this horse should retire because they're increasing risk with age? So with that, I'll say um, thank you and we can open it up to questions. Yeah, so thanks again, uh, ladies, doctor, so much for your uh, time this afternoon and the fascinating research that's being done. It's, as we all know, it's an important issue that we need to tackle in all horses. So for those of you on the uh, web webinar, there is a Q&A button at the bottom if you have some questions. But to start it off, I'll ask, and that is, you know, a general question that we got was, is how does heart rate? Is, is that related at all to this? Because the animal is such, the horse has such a magnificent heart. How, what's that first, you know, the heart rate or how is that related? So that's a really good question. Um, we know that when horses develop very, very high heart rates, so heart rates over 220 um, at exercise, they're much more likely to be having a problem. That's, that's abnormal. Um, <clears throat> so to some extent, we know that, but I think we'll know a lot more about that when we've got all of these ECGs done. This is, um, as far as I'm aware, the largest study of actually actual exercising ECGs. Um, so we'll be able to sort of quantify where how high the heart rates are going and whether or not they're um contribute where, whether or not it's just the heart rate and the horses the horses in a rhythm a normal rhythm and that's causing the high heart rate or whether or not they're actually in an arrhythmia which is consistent with them having um a very high heart rate so i think that's a great question and we'll be able to answer it a lot more um right now we like i say we know that very high heart rates um are are a sign of a problem, um, but we'll hopefully know more by the end of the study as to which ones sort of seem to be more pathologic than the others. Yeah, and I know that your research is focused on the racehorses because you have Canterbury in your backyard and that's kind of a captive audience uh, for you guys. And then the racing industry is at one location, whether it's standard breads, thoroughbreds. But you mentioned an iPhone app is kind of the ideal thing. And I would assume that would be you know, an average horse owner like myself could go out in the backyard or before an event and talk about how sport horse people would use that as well. Yeah, and we'd love to. I actually come from a much more sports horse background than a race horse background. So we would love to work more with the sports horses. But like you say, we, we're very lucky with the locations of the tracks that are near us. Um, so I think, you know, these Obviously, the, the genetics we're looking at is predominantly thoroughbreds and standard breds. There are a lot of thoroughbred um, event horses. So um, what we would need to do is extend out whether or not the the sort of genetics are similar across breeds, whether or not the warm blood crosses or the warm bloods also have the same variants. And then we can monitor them more, more closely. And I mean, realistically, we could sort of envision some kind of app where you could Take, take the ECG on the farm and you're absolutely right you could use this device um, at home record it and then the app would analyze it and say your horse is having problems or it's not having problems or whatever else um, and then you should have a more thorough cardiac workup or something like that so I think there's a great potential to to look at this um, as well and you know we could you can extend this out to looking at the horses before they go and do their um, cross country course. So, you know, they're probably not going to collapse during their dressage, but they can be monitored if the, if there are any concerns. So those, those apps could be used. Mm, I feel a horse just feels a bit off. Let's just pop an, pop an ECG on and just double check if that's the problem. Obviously, there are 20 other things that could be causing the problem. But um, from the collapsing and dying from a cardiac event issue, that's certainly something that could be useful as well. Yeah. And the, the app is nice. That's the same technology that now, right, lets an ECG trace happen on your Apple Watch. You can actually go out and, and get an AliveCore um, ECG to use with your phone. The piece that Grayson's allowing us really to do is to figure out the computational part to say, even if it looked normal, um, this horse is at high risk, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so it's not, I, I think what I'm hearing is it's not only important for you guys to under, understand population studies, but it's going to get real important to understand individuals as well. And we have to do this research on the population to drill down to the individuals. Is that? Yeah, exactly. Um, technology has failed us, but we made a slide to sort of point that out, right? We would be able to, at birth, identify those individuals that we have to mon monitor differently. Um, yeah, so we go from, uh, there's a two-pronged test to it as well, pro or attack. First is the genetic aspect of it, and then 
after the horse has been born is in performance. It's the monitoring of that function of the heart, right? Right. And, you know, people ask the question sometimes, well, why not just do extra monitoring on all of them? That's not always feasible, especially in the track, right? So if we can say to the regulatory veterinarians, these are, you know, this 20% of horses, you need to make sure that you run an ECG um, before every race. That, that sort of helps make it more feasible, I think, to really put into practice. Yeah, and I think that as you were saying, people are getting more familiar with iPhone apps and heart rates and monitoring their own uh, fitness on whatever band they're using these days. So it's becoming more commonplace, but we don't have any more questions, but I would just like to thank you ladies for, uh, oh, here you go. I found the picture there. It is. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, I'm gonna exit and re 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 reiterate the, the key takeaway point points. Yeah, so the idea that we were just talking about, right, was you take this horse, you decide if he looks like he's going to be normal or not, and then you make uh, monitoring decisions from there. And poor performance, probably the first factor in all of this for checking in, right, for horse owners is not performing like itself. Yeah, I think that's an area that we really are probably missing quite a lot. Um, so obviously, when a horse doesn't run well, or it tra doesn't train well, they're very quick to be scoped, they'll look at them from a lameness point of view and everything else. And some of the horses are not, there's nothing wrong with them. But are they having any arrhythmia or not? We had a um, two year old um, that we looked at because it wasn't um, really wasn't performing very well at all. And she was in um, atrial fibrillation. Um, and, you know, fortunately, the vet put um, put the um, their stethoscope on and said, hmm. um, and we were there. So I looked at it and um, she was she was in atrial fibrillation. But I think that's obviously the most obvious thing. And that's super easy. That's relatively easy to detect. It, what's what's takes more effort is these ones that are happening at exercise, because you just don't know because by the time they've come back to the stall and you pop your stethoscope on, they're probably back to normal again. I mean, most of the thoroughbreds, the way Canterbury set up, it's not that far from most of the barns fr from the track to the barns. But by the time they're getting back to the barns, their heart rates already dropped down to below 60 and is coming down to 40. Even despite the fact he could well have been at 180 200 when they were training um and so if we didn't have the ecg on at the time as the heart rate's going back down again we'd completely miss any of that information as the horse is going from sort of the sympathetic tone that it needs to race versus the sort of more vaguely um, parasympathetic tone that they have at rest so um but what so we're missing all of that but exercising ECGs are difficult. You can't just, I mean, there are devices you can just put on um, the racehorses, but a lot of people don't use those um, mm. because they're expensive and they need to require interpretation. So if we can combine the genetics and then using the ECGs to screen the horses that do need to be monitored more closely, then hopefully we can get to the point where just in that rest ECG could be used to say, yes, this horse is at risk. No, it, no, it isn't. Yeah, so the horse has to get up to a certain speed or a certain uh, exercise level to experience arrhythmia, right? Is that? Yes and no. That what to to increase our likelihood of getting horses with that develop arrhythmias exercise, we're trying to get them when they're breezing or when they're galloping or, or training um, for the standard breads. Um, but probably there are horses that are having arrhythmias at lower levels as well. Um, but we just want to maximize the number that we get. But the more we go on, the, the more we will know about, you know, how fast do they need to be going to um, develop an arrhythmia or not. Um, and I think probably the ones that are going to develop arrhythmias are probably developing them at lower speeds as well. Um, we just don't know. So that's more of a hypothesis than, than anything else. Well, I don't have any further questions. I don't see any more from the webinar. So again, I'd just like to thank you all so much for not only coming on today and explaining your research, but taking the time and for all you do for horses. It's a uh, great undertaking up there at Minnesota, and we really appreciate your efforts. As everyone knows, uh, this is a problem uh, that has continued to bother us, and we need to, or continue to bother us and our horses, uh, more importantly, and we need to address this going forward. So thank you so much with your research. Well, thank you very much for your support. I mean, it, this literally couldn't be possible without it, and we're really excited about this, and um, hopefully we'll be able to fill in some gaps in the space in the next year or so. Well, good. We look forward to checking back in with you guys later in the yeah. year. Yeah, thank you again. Yeah.
thank you all. And thanks everyone for attending today. We really appreciate it. Have a great afternoon. And Bye. you.